So why is this? Why are words that were once certainly in English, I hope the Danes took a more sophisticated and enlightened view, um, but to the British considered rather dowdy, like making, crafted, artisanal, and heritage, they're now completely ubiquitous in advertising campaigns. YouTube clips of potters working at their wheels are incredibly popular. There's even a Throw Your Own Pots show on British television, a sort of reality TV show <laughs> where people learn ceramics. And um, one of the best-selling books, not only in Britain but throughout Europe, is Norwegian Wood, which is a book on forestry and carpentry in Norway. And as I understand this, feel free to contradict me, Christmas with Klaus Dalby is a very popular show on Danish television. So this, um, it sounds comical, but actually all these phenomena have had a huge impact in stimulating interest in craft and in a very serious way. Um, new craft courses are opening at art and design schools all over the world, except depressingly in my home country, Britain where because of government funding cuts, they're closing. So why is this happening? Why has there been this groundswell of interest in craft, not just by professional designers and makers, but among the public? Now, the short answer is because craft is a wonderful discipline and making is a hugely enriching thing to do, but there are other explanations too. Now, one is that after decades in which standardization and mass manufacturing, these very important themes of the modern movement, seemed heroic. We now take their benefits almost completely for granted. We find it very difficult to ignore their shortcomings because we know much too much about the dark side of globalization to be unaware of its consequences. So just as in the 19th century, when William Morris and John Ruskin looked at factory-made goods, they thought of exploited child labor, it's impossible now for us to look at a smartphone, whether it's by Apple, Samsung, or another major manufacturer, without worrying whether it's made from conflict minerals, by poorly paid, overworked employees of an abusive subcontractor, or imagining it failing to biodegrade on a toxic landfill site for decades to come. In other words, when we look at even the most sophisticated factory goods now, we have serious cause for concern. So this, of course, makes the kind of artisanal skills in projects like Studio Former Phantasmas or Sheila Hicks seem very appealing. And the same applies to the focus on responsible making in the community design projects executed by Assemble the Granby Four Streets project in Liverpool in Northern England. And the aim of the project is to work with the local residents to reconstruct and reinvent several rows of empty terraced houses. And it's a model of intelligent and sensitive social design, largely because rather than imposing their own ideas on the local people, assemble, listen to them, and designed accordingly, both when rebuilding the houses Developing interesting intersections like this, this is literally a sort of greenhouse stroke public park that they built in a derelict site in the Granby area. But they have also set up studios at which local people are trained in artisanal skills to make various objects. Uh, so they're learning carpentry, ceramics, and other useful skills. And so the products they made were sold in the Turner Prize exhibition and are now generally available online. Another interesting community making project is by the British ceramicist Claire Toomey. And it is this. It's called 10,000 Pots. Um, and it um, is part of her continuing experiments into community making and into her research into artisanal history. And this was a special commission for a new institution in Northern England. It's COCA, the Centre of Ceramic Art, which is at the York Art Gallery in Yorkshire in Northern England. And um, the York Art Gallery has one of the finest studio pottery, 20th century studio pottery collections of any um, museum or gallery in the world. And so the Centre for Ceramic Art is devoted to the collections. It has works by amazing ceramicists like Lucy Ree, Bernard Leach, and so on. And they wanted a contemporary installation to celebrate the opening of Coca. And so Claire worked on this for several years, and there are 10,000 slip cast bowls 
on those shelves. It's absolutely enormous, so very dramatic when you walk into the gallery. And the pots were made by hundreds of different people to the same moulds. Some of them were accomplished potters. Um, also the curators and the director of the York Art Gallery pitched in. But others were made by ingenue potters in community groups in London and in York. And her latest project, um, which she's actually unveiling on the 27th of January, so in two weeks' time, is to mark Holocaust Memorial Day. And last year, on that date, she handed out cards on Westminster Bridge in London to people who happened to walk by. There were 10,000 cards. And there was one question on the cards, what human qualities allow society to flourish? And so people were invited to submit their answers, and each of them is to be printed on a porcelain spoon made by Claire, and they're going to be given away to 10,000 people on the same bridge on Holocaust Memorial Day on Wednesday in two weeks' time. So this is another really lovely example of how a very inventive maker is engaging people who wouldn't normally be involved in the making process. Now, I think another explanation for this upsurge of interest in making is because we devote so much of our time now to devouring information and entertainment and imagery from digital screens. So it's not surprising that the spontaneity of craftsmanship seems very attractive to us as a contrast. The same desire has fueled the growing popularity of live events like concerts, festivals and debates, as well as DIY activities, gardening, knitting, pottery, baking and so on, as well as being a throw-your-own-pot show on British television, one of the most popular shows is The Great British Bake Off, which is all about baking cakes. Um, now, it has made the sort of authenticity of making feel very fresh and appealing again. And it has also made us more amenable to the charms of craftsmanship and to the haptic qualities like touch and scent that can't be replicated digitally. Now, both qualities played an important role in one of my favourite British design projects of the last year. And it's this one, um, which was designed and made by Max Lamb. There he is um, in his T-shirt and jeans. And it's called My Grandfather's Tree. And um, Max spends a lot of time at his grandfather's farm in North Yorkshire. And a female ash tree, which I think was nearly 200 years old, on the farm was dying. It had a, an incurable disease. And so they knew it would have to be felled. So Max set himself the challenge of felling it as responsibly as possible in a way that would enable every part of the tree to be used productively. And so the main legacy is this. It's 131 components of the tree the logs, the trunk and the branches, which were cut in ways that were defined by sort of um, branches springing off or sort of gnarly parts of the tree that have been turned into useful things, benches, seats, little tables and so on. And it not only looks very beautiful when you see it in real life, there was an exhibition of it at the London Design Festival in Somerset House in autumn. It smells delicious too and really feels wonderful to touch. Now, the Dutch book designer, Irma Boom, who luckily for me designed Hello World, is also a designer who, although she doesn't make her work herself, she's very involved with specifying its making. And she also uses haptic qualities like sense and touch in her work to engage the readers and to guide them through their books. So she infused the pages of one book with fresh, freshly brewed coffee, so it would have a lingering aroma, and hacked the pages of another, here it is, with a circular saw. And this, fittingly, was a beautiful book she designed on Sheila Hicks textiles. So the idea was that the end, end paper of the book, sorry, the page edges, would have the sort of text, tactile, textural feel of the textiles. But it also unleashes the scent of paper on the, the book. So it actually makes just turning the pages a really lovely sensory experience. Now, I think one explanation for this renewed interest in touch in particular is fueled by the delicacy with which we have learnt to use digital objects. So 
Here's a little GIF of this is the slide to refresh mechanism on a smartphone. And if you look at the way people scroll down, they push, they prod, they pull, they slide their digital screens, it's often very beautiful. It's almost as if they're playing a musical instrument, not desperately trying to get their latest emails. And so again, I think this has made us much more conscious of the tactile qualities of the objects in our lives. Sadly, one of the shortcomings of contemporary design is that we don't have an adequate vocabulary to express this. People tend to find it much easier to describe how something looks than how it smells or how it feels. And I think as haptic qualities become increasingly important in design, this is going to have to change. We're going to have to learn how to become much more expressive about them. But some designers are also using our intuitive, non-judgmental response to these phenomena to their advantage. And one of them works here in Copenhagen, and this is uh, the Danish-Swedish furniture designer, Chris Lilienberg Hallström, who's one of a group of designers that are experimenting with ways of developing mass-manufactured objects that challenge gender stereotypes by reflecting more fluid and nuanced representations of gender identity. And one example of this is Georg, a, a stool that Chris designed. Now, Chris uses texture as a tactical tool, believing that our sense of touch is less likely to be prone to stereotypes in terms of gender identity and other aspects of our personal identities, certainly far less so than visual images like color, shape, and symbolism. So the Georg school, which stool that she designed for Skagarak, and I'm sure I've mispronounced that, so apologies. Um, consists of this pillow in a richly textured fabric that's tied by a leather strand to the chair onto a wooden base, which also feels very beautiful. So each sitter can adjust the pillow, so they customize the chair to make it the right shape for them. And in doing so, they discover the pleasure of touching the wood and the fabric. Now, the Georg has won lots of mainstream design awards, including the Red Dot Award in Germany, which is a very serious industry award. And I suspect that was because, as you can see, it's a beautifully made, very elegant, but also robust piece of furniture. So I suspect it was for those conventional virtues that they chose it. But I find it very interesting that Chris has added this subtext about gender identity in a very subtle but very intelligent way. But digital technology is playing a part in changing the practice of craft and design, as well as how we um, interpret it. And one argument is that the definition of craft can be expanded to include software design. Traditionalists disagree with this, but the software design process of typing instructions into a computer in the form of code is surprisingly similar to the arts and crafts movement's definition of a dedicated individual applying their skills by hand, albeit with a mouse and a keyboard rather than a carpenter's chisel or a potter's wheel. And similarly, advances in digital production technologies like 3D printing are enabling product designers to adopt the typically artisanal roles of makers and fixers. So networks of designers, makers, and repairers like these characters in Fixperts, which is a making network in London, are experimenting with systems like this that are so fast and so precise that they can fabricate entire objects or parts of them individually. And this is a recent and Fixperts project at the London Design Festival a year ago. Now, as these technologies become more sophisticated, they'll give designers more and more control over the outcome of their work by enabling them to design, customize, make, and repair it, just as traditional village blacksmiths and carpenters did for centuries. But they'll also enable the rest of us, the 99% of the population who aren't designers, to do so too by participating in the process as designers, makers, and customizers. Now, all of these changes have already transformed and enlivened design, craft, and making by helping them to tackle the challenges and embrace the opportunities of post-industrial culture. And I, for one, am looking forward to see how they do so to an even greater degree in future. Thank you.